Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Frontline Club. Thank you for coming. Uh, before I hand over to Stuart Purvis, who's chairing tonight's debate, if I can ask you to switch your phones to silent. And when it comes to questions, if you can wait for the microphone, because we are broadcasting live. Over to Stuart. OK, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, whether you're here in the room or you're watching or listening to the stream or you're listening to this months later on the podcast. Um, it's 1971. Uh, in fact, it's 1991, and um, a few SAS soldiers have been detained, captured by the Iraqis during the uh, Allied invasion of Kuwait to regain Kuwait for the West. Uh, at the end of the war, uh, those SAS men are released in a very public ceremony. It's filmed by the world's media uh, and shown throughout the world. A few months later, as editor then of ITN, I was uh, invited to speak at an army staff college, and I did the usual kind of discussion, probably quite similar to the one we're going to have here this evening. And afterwards, uh, an officer came up to me, and he reprimanded me for the fact that ITN had shown the faces of the SAS soldiers who had been released by the Iraqis. I made the point that it would have been a rather futile gesture to have blacked out their faces when the whole of the rest of the world's media had, uh, had already shown, or were going to show their faces. To which he said to me, well, we are all part of GB Limited, aren't we? <laughs> and it struck me that that was a very interesting question, so interesting that I actually made it a subject of a lecture at Oxford a year later. So this relationship between the media and the military has been going on. Normally, we go back to the Crimean War, don't we, and William Russell, and when we come to him later. We have got, I think, an, an excellent panel, uh, which Millicent has put together. Um, let me introduce them from the left, Lorna Ward, now, if there is a GB Limited, Lorna has got a foot in a number of different rooms in this house. Um, perhaps as she talks later, she'll explain exactly how this came about. But she is the Deputy Foreign News Editor of Sky News. But she's also back just from last week from having been the media advisor to ISAF in Afghanistan. That's a very interesting double act. And she can explain how that works and how that, uh, what view she has as a result. Then we've got Vaughan Smith. Of course, the founder of the Frontline Club, but also, I think, a former army officer, and more recently, an illustrious independent filmmaker who's covered all sorts of conflicts in all sorts of places and has very interesting views of the result. But then from the far end, we've got Robert Fox, who I first met when we worked in the BBC many years ago. He covered the Falklands, if I remember, for the BBC, um, which is where he met our other guest, Major General Jonathan Shaw, for the first time. Robert's now the defense editor of the Evening Standard. I think he's really so illustrious that he's probably a defense analyst of truth. Um, and then Major General Jonathan Shaw, who was a former uh, commander of UK Land Forces, came up through the Parachute Regiment, became, I think, the commandant of the Parachute Regiment. Um, according to the Daily Telegraph, he is a former commander of the SAS, but he couldn't possibly comment on that. Uh, Telegraph also said that he was one of the bright young generals who decided to leave because of defence cuts, so he probably wouldn't want to talk about that either. <laughs> but we are really pleased you're here because uh, the guest from the Ministry of Defence needs no introduction because there isn't one. Um, <laughs> effectively, Melissa and I think in the Frontline Club were really hoping to get somebody from the MOD here, but that they're not here. Uh, Jonathan will tell us as he goes along how he does and doesn't agree with current MOD policy. And at times, I may be forced to play the MOD uh, to you challenge won't. some of the guests, <laughs> a most unlikely role I've, I've ever had. But first of all, we're going to ask each of our panelists, to, for, off the top of their heads, for about three or four minutes, tell us kind of where they come from on this issue of media-military relations. First of all, uh, Lorna. Uh, good evening. As uh, Stuart mentioned, I, I do work for Sky on the one hand as a journalist on the foreign desk. Um, but I was in the regular army for five years. And having retrained as a journalist, then joined the TA, and I'm part of the media operations group, so working within um, media and communications in the territorial army. Um, it does mean that, as a result, I've deployed to Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, all either in uniform or in civilian clothes, and in some cases, one after the other in uniform and then in, in civilian clothes. So I've seen it as a journalist on the ground, but also as, as somebody working for the military on the ground. So really very much one foot in each camp um, and very frustrating sometimes in both and each of the jobs um, for, for, various, for various reasons. Um, I just thought uh, to give an idea of the sort of things I've come across, I've got four um, sort of issues that, that might provoke um, discussion, I hope would provoke discussion um, that I've come across and I've really 
sat on the fence a little bit at this stage um, and, and to these, how these four issues come across from an army perspective and the media perspective. The first I've, I've come across really is a lack of understanding and this really on both parts. Um, the uh, army on the one side has relatively limited training in terms of what the media does, how it operates and what it's trying to achieve. Uh, but on the same, on the other side of the fence, uh, the media has often a very limited idea of what the military does uh, and it often gets uh, typecast uh, as this elite, or not elite, boys club uh, and therefore rather inaccessible and a little bit detached. Impatience is another thing I've come across again on both sides of the fence. Um, the army has a job to do. It has deadlines to, to, to reach just the same as the media does uh, and as a result wants to get going with those when they're on operations and journalists can sometimes be a bit of a hindrance to that but on the other side of the fence the media is really impatient especially with multi-platform uh, media these days and deadlines and 24-hour news and therefore is very intolerant often of the fact that the military's main, uh, main aim is not to accommodate the media on operations. Um, thirdly, I'd mention uh, egos or maybe personalities is a best, better way of uh, describing it. Um, in the army, much like uh, in, in general civilian life, uh, a lot of people are, are in awe of people they've seen on TV, including sometimes journalists, God knows why, and they get quite flattered by the attention. So do a long interview and then find that it doesn't get out on air anywhere, very disappointing and a little bit of a disillusioned person you have at the other end of it. Um, and in the media just as guilty, but in a different way, journalists becoming the story. It's all about how brave they're being under fire, not how brave the troops they're with are being under fire. And lastly, I would just say overall that it's potential, or I would suggest that uh, possibly a lack of communication between opposing cultures is where we're possibly going with, um, with the, the difficulty in the relationship between the media and the military. Both very specialised worlds, both very self-sufficient, and both probably equally misunderstood by the general public to a large extent, uh, and therefore keep themselves to themselves and find it quite difficult to open up um, to the other. Um, that's where I'd leave it just to, as a starter. Thank starter you very much indeed, Vaughan. Vaughan, do you want to pick it up from there? Um, I've been a freelance video journalist for 15, 20 years. Um, I've done seven embeds uh, in Afghanistan, um, with the, both Americans and the, and the British. I'm an ex-soldier myself, and I've even been with my old regiment quite a lot. Um, I, I really have uh, a significant issue, and I, I'm going to focus it on the whole ca the, the, the reporting of casualties. This is, this is the area where I think it's going wrong. It's, it's the area for me that I'm uncomfortable with. At, today, if you go on an embed with the British Army, unless you perhaps are the BBC or a large broadcasting union, you can actually negotiate specific access, you are not allowed to film casualties. Um, I find that this unacceptable, and for me it's got to the point whereby I don't think it's acceptable as a journalist to cover these things, um, because in effect you're supporting the war if you're not covering it. I mean, interestingly, if you look, if you look behind me, there are two pictures. There's um, uh, the Hiroshima bomb and there's uh, Nagasaki. Now, um, this, this club illustrates this very point by having these pictures there, because all too often we're filming this sort of thing. Uh, it's not an ugly picture, it's rather a beautiful picture, but the consequences of it are, are obviously ugly. Um, I don't believe that journalists can be expected to participate in the public sanitization of our wars, uh, while exposing at the same time terrible violence in places like Syria. Um, and uh, essentially, um, in our industry, if you look at the other pictures on this wall, because I'm rather glad they're here, they're all showing the suffering of war. Um, this is what we're supposed to do. This is what we're taught to do. Um, the army can't restrict us in covering these things um, I, I, in this way. It, it's just unacceptable. It's, um, it, it's against our calling. And that's fundamentally where I'm going. Now, OK, how do the army do it? I'm hoping we can talk about that, because there are all sorts of things we can cover. There's something called the Green Book, which is essentially um, what you read and what you sign as a journalist to go on an embed with the British Army. And, I, and we'll probably talk about the fact that the British Army and the Americans do it differently. Um, that in that green book, it, it, it doesn't really tell you that you can't film casualties. Um, in fact, the green book I've got here, it's huge. It's, a, you know, it's about this. Um, uh, and it's got uh, something like 85 paragraphs and lots of annexes. Only two of them even deal with casualties. Um, patient confidentiality is brought up but not explained, and I think this is a major problem. 
patient confidentiality is essentially, um, and it might need further explanation later, um, the, 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 the manner by which the NHS certainly very stringently apply restrictions on, on people's data, patient data. Um, I believe the MOD are effectively using this patient confidentiality, which you learn of its restrictions pretty well as you get into theatre, um, to prevent us from covering uh, these casualties. Um, and it's an argument against privacy. And it's got legal justifications according to the um, uh, uh, Section 8 of, I've got it written down here somewhere, Section 8 of the European um, uh, Human Rights Charter, the, the Data Protection Act, um, and various things like that which we can, we can look at. Um, but the, the military haven't accommodated the exceptions that journalism's ha journalism has that are well established um, that their work in the public interest um, uh, should be allowed despite the demand, and um, perhaps the important demand for, for privacy um, <coughs> by, by our public. Um, our soldiers are, are, rep are armed representatives, and we can't uh, not cover them. That's probably all you want me to say at the moment. Well, it, there's a lot of stuff, and a lot of, <laughs> I think to many of us, a lot of new stuff. Yeah. On, and I think uh, when we come back, as we go along, I'm going to ask you to perhaps, I think you know you've got some <laughs> clips to show us. <laughs> Jonathan, that seems an appropriate moment to come to you. Um, yes, I shall try and keep it to the four minutes you asked. Um, if we live in an era, as Rupert Smith would describe, of war amongst the people, then, uh, it's a qu then uh, conflicts we're engaged in is not about killing other people, it's about the perception, it's about how people see the conflict, it's about public opinion. Uh, and therefore the phrase, the orchestration of war, becomes uh, pertinent. And as the military are players in this conflict, they have to be part of, they have to make an attempt to orchestrate uh, what's going on and the perception of what is going on. So that's where I'm coming from, that the military need to be one of the players, they need to be in there giving their view of what's going on because they are a player on the stage and they need to have a voice shaping that perception. So I'm a very strong believer in that. And uh, yeah. The problem is, uh, for the MOD, who do they trust to give that message? And that question of trust, it seems to me, is absolutely crucial. Uh, without wishing to get into military jargon, there's a difference between command and control. If you command people, you give them the trust, you let them go out there, be 90% successful in their message, and you accept that they'll be 10% cock up, but you'll make that up as you go along. That, I think, roughly speaking, was how perhaps we used to be when you used to have Army, Navy, Air Force, military spokesmen that spoke to the press. However, what I think we've seen over time is an increasing focus on that 10% cock up and what we've seen in his increasing control freakery, it began with the getting rid of the single service uh, representatives talking to the military, but because the press still want to know what's happening in the services, uh, they still find out, and that increases the sense of distrust, and what I think is we've seen a sort of an increasing anality from the MOD, uh, which is now at a level where they won't even send a representative along to a discussion like this to represent the MOD. Um, it seems to me, my third point, that the MOD, if we're talking about the MOD in relation to the media, there are three distinct bodies that you can talk about there. One is the armed services, the second is the department, and the third is the minister. My view on this is this has now all been uh, elided into one interest, and that is the minister. Yeah. And I have a horrible feeling that it makes spads of us all. And I, I resent that, and I think it's a big mistake. And I do say that on the record. I think it's... A, I think I, I, really resent that, I think. My fourth point is from my experience, and I would say that trust is personal. When you're a journalist dealing with the military, when you're the military dealing with the journalists, you can't lump them all together. It's a very personal thing. You develop a personal relationship with a journalist, the journalist develops a personal relationship with the soldier, and each of them has to respect that trust. Never believe the other person thinks like you do, because they don't. You each have a job to do. The soldier is manipulating the media just as the media is looking for the soldier for a story. You've got to remember that they come at it from different, uh, different uh, perspectives. But if you respect that perspective, you can have a very helpful relationship sometimes. There are two journalists I won't talk to. One, because he betrayed me, sold me down the Swanee to, to write a book and make some more money. And the other, because I gave him the story uh, and he told the story that his editor had sent him out to the country to find out about rather than reporting reality. And when you detect as a soldier that this guy has come out there to a theater not to report the truth, but to, to find the evidence to substantiate a story that has already been demanded by the editor back in London, that's when you start to lose trust uh, in the press. So my plea to the press would be, do report what you see. 
But the final point uh, is one about context. And if there's one school of journalism that I uh, particularly um, am irritated by at the moment, it's what I would call the photographic school of journalism, which takes a snapshot of reality, sees a dead child, sees who killed it, puts a white hat on the, on the person who's been killed, a black hat on the person who shot it, and simplifies the whole situation. Soldiers deal with complexity, and that's why they deal in messy situations. The tendency of the press to simplify the story into white hats and black hats, good guys and bad guys, a photographic snapshot, actually distorts it. And if, to pick up that phrase, work in the public interest, which I would have a question mark about, I would actually urge that if you're really going to work in the public interest, try to portray the complexity, try to dig beneath the photographic image and actually explain what's going on, the direction of movements and why things are going on. And if you want an example of that, look at Syria and how long it was before people recognized this wasn't good guys against bad guys, poor aggressed guys against, against nasty Assad, that actually it was a deeply messy, complex, horrid situation. Because the press and the politicians, they feed off each other, and for far too long, both sides were allowed to get away with the idea that they were good guys and bad guys, and now we've all come to a shuddering halt because we've realized it's all a mess. And actually, the press are players in this game, and they have to take that responsibility seriously. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Robert, uh, a final of our openers. I haven't really thought out what I want to say because I've partly lived this in the background, but I'm not entirely devoted to the military. I think working with the military, embedding, being an accredited correspondent, which I have been twice, is a necessary evil. And w the point at which you feel it is unnecessary, you get out. <clears throat> I think um, it is the kind of relationship, it's a one night, one night stand, not even a romance for two nights in Las Vegas. Um, you, you are there to tell your own story, and I have always <coughs> used this, I'm sorry, Charlie, to tell you, as an end to my particular means. Um, I'd like to just give two, since we're talking history and context, and there are those of you in the audience, I think, who've covered Vietnam, I have been very conscious in the conditioning of British media military relations of two things. One is the long legacy of the Great Wars, where various things happened that the castle correspondents in the Great War didn't tell the true story and the poets did. And the other thing was the very close relationship, which was worked to a common end, but it was a critical relationship on both sides of World War II. When you had something that was quite spectacularly going really wrong, like the assault on Casino, I talked to Winfred Vaughan Thomas at length about this, they were allowed to say within a certain period, and it was about a week to 10 days, that it had gone wrong, three assault, three offensive, three plans had gone wrong, and two of the generals had been sacked. That was on the record and allowed to be said. Would that happen today? And the third thing I'm going to say very obviously is Vietnam. I can remember standing at Goose Green at the start line or sometime thereabout, and Major Chris Keeble, the second in command who was about <coughs> to take over, said, we've got to be wary of you guys because the press lost the Vietnam War. I said, oh, if, it was, and if he was here today, I'd say the same. If only it was so simple. Um, there are simple misperceptions on both sides uh, in this. Um, relationships are complex. I don't think this is anything like a, as big a deal as it's been in most of my life because the nature of news is changing. The nature of the military is changing. The nature of the military role in British public life and, and in common endeavor is diminishing. Uh, for colleagues here and myself, you know that we've had 30 years of Northern Ireland. I spent a hell of a lot of time there. I was involved in the Balkans, or British forces there, um, but d obviously didn't see the Balkans through a British military lens at all. Nor do I see Afghanistan, and I've done the Afghanistans and the Iraqs and so on. But just to conclude, um, it's really where we got to with Leveson, is that Leveson didn't seem to realize that history was about beginnings and not endings that it wasn't about whether Murdoch was a bastard, yes he is, and also the police were corrupt and had been corrupted by journalists, yes it's true, and hacking's a dreadful thing and can be dealt with by the criminal law and paparazzi do get out of control and should this be changed from a civil misdemeanor to something else. But then to say that you, we will control the news either by charter or statute is simply absurd. And by the way, just think, if, um, if, if news was subject to such the news business, the print business, which is the generation of ideas now, so much disproportionately more than the broadcast news is, of ideas and news, of following lines of investigations, of long stories, 
And I hold by that. That's why I've spent two thirds of my life in print and one third in broadcasting. The nature of news has changed so much, but I give you my proposition, if Karl Rove and Dallas the Campbell had been around and you had statutory restrictions on the news, where the hell would we all be now? W news will come out in different ways from different people by different means. And that's why, in a peculiar way, the discussion of the intimacy of media military relations, the embeds in Afghanistan, that we can control your message, for me now, although it does create large problems, which we're going to go into in this debate, it is becoming increasingly irrelevant. Well, thank you very much for <laughs> those openers. Um, there's so many points flying around, but just to, I think, Vaughan, as we've got this video, it'd be good to get some up-to-date information of what it was like to be on this embed recently. I think it may fit with what Jonathan's been saying about the ambition of the military clearly to get a message across and to see who might help them to get that message across. So do you just want to explain what actually happened on the last embed you, uh, you were on? It was in September, October last year. I was actually with my old company, the Queen's Company of the Grenadier Guards, who I served with 25 years ago. Um, I was with a platoon that had suffered, a platoon of 29 men at full strength, um, had suffered three deaths and uh, 12 other casualties. Um, so they'd had a battering, it was at the end of their tour. Um, and um, I filmed, I was rather fortunate, because I had a minder, I was accompanied and under control. He'd gone to the <laughs> loo, hadn't he? Um, so it was rather good, because um, uh, then uh, one of the officers told me that they, they just heard some uh, serious news and that uh, uh, one of the, their colleagues had been killed on another operation somewhere else. And so I get out my camera and, 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 and film it. Um, and why I think we're showing it now, it's about two and a half minutes long, is because um, I then had to clear, which is the, the arrangement, uh, use of it or broadcast of this material with the Ministry of Defence Press Department. Um, and I got a, a, a very uh, curious response, I thought, because at first they said that um, it, it, it gave away secrets effectively. It, it, breached, um, it, it breached operational security, which you know, I couldn't quite work out how that was. Then it said that it breached this patient confidentiality that I've referred to, and there are no patients. Um, and then they said it would upset the families of the deceased. Well, I, I, I would suggest it, it didn't. Um, and I think that's why we're seeing it to see. I think this explains the problems we're having as, as journalists in Afghanistan now in terms of getting anything that shows uh, even a small degree of human suffering in our troops. In the sweltering Helmand heat, Captain Oliver Holcroft is preparing the most difficult of announcements for his troops. The men are told to gather. It is with great sorrow and regret that I have to inform you once again that the company has been subject to a cruel twist of fate. Lance Corporal Groom has tragically been killed as a result of his wounds from an IED strike onto his jackal that he was commanding yesterday evening. Lance Corporal Groom was without doubt the most professional of soldiers in the company. He was an honest, affable, and exceptionally reliable soldier. He had an extremely promising career ahead of him. Our thoughts and prayers or with his family and friends at this particularly difficult time. Gone, but never forgotten. As difficult a pill as it is to swallow, like I said the other day, only a few days ago with Garth and Whittle, there will be a time for mourning. But it's so important that you harness the resolve now that we're still out here to push on to the finish tape, i.e. back in full price. Don't be distracted, keep focused, and let's uh, try and avoid anything like this again. These soldiers are from the Queen's Company of the Grenadier Guards, nearing the end of a brutal six-month tour. The man they have lost is a friend and a colleague. Fighting alongside them just a few days ago, he was killed while attached to another unit. This is the first time they've heard. For all of them, it's a devastating shock. For some in particular, it's almost too much. Look after him, make sure he's okay. Yeah. Okay, lad. Now, Vaughan, that, that went out on Channel 4 News, was it? it went out on Channel, Channel 4 News. Yeah. Now, when I, I, I watched it at home, and when I saw it, I thought, well, it, it's powerful television. 
I thought the military came out of it rather well. well I thought what we right. saw was an officer who was clearly in control, if not although moved. We saw a group of men where there were stiff upper lips going on, but there was also towards these, as people walked across, you could see a couple of guys at the back who were sort of holding their heads in tears. But it showed a kind of a resolution, if you like, of they were going to go back into battle. It didn't show anyone sort of running away. If I was the MODPR, I would have thought, actually, that was rather good. Why would I not want that shown? But that's not the experience you had. Um, I think you can criticize the camera work, but I don't think the contents, you know, I mean. Um, <laughs> It was, it was a bit disturbing. The unfortunate thing was I had a second piece, which I didn't get out because I'd lost my peg, which they wanted out. And so it was just completely, completely nuts. Um, but I, what, I, what disturbed me about it was that, that the way they responded to try to prevent it, um, it, it, it was, uh, was incompetent in terms of, you know, it, they didn't address it properly. Um, and then they said, oh, well, if we let this go out, then other people will do the same sort of thing. Uh, they had something else. I mean, look, I have to confess, I, I, I had been... Uh, one of the reasons I, I, I was keen to get that was because I tried to film something called a ramp ceremony. A ramp ceremony is another dignified, it's a parade, um, where out of, um, out of Camp Bastion, which is the main, um, the biggest camp, British camp in, in, in Helmand, when a soldier is tragically killed, um, they have a, a, a dignified and, and moving ceremony to send him home onto the plane. And uh, they won't let the journalists film that. Uh, and I accept the fact that if journalists could, they would, um, because it shows some emotion. Um, uh, but uh, again, they, they argue that this is a private moment. But how can a parade be a private moment? I, I don't get that. If I can just jump in on that very quickly. Um, your argument about the ramp ceremony, that, that it's worth knowing that the ramp ceremony happens in Camp Bastion for the troops. There is also a sort of coming off the ramp ceremony, if you like, at Bryce Norton, which is shown live on on every outlet possible and is open to the press. That is the public moment. It is private, it may be a parade, there may be 200 of us standing there, but that is for a lot of the soldiers standing at a ramp ceremony in Camp Bastion, the only opportunity they will have to say goodbye to their friend, because they will not be home for the funeral, they will not go and, and see his family, they'll be stuck in, in, in Afghanistan for weeks, months after the event. So the ramp ceremony really is a very private moment, despite the fact that it's a parade and that it's organized, but it is a moment where the, 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 the soldiers' friends get to stand up and say very personal feelings, very personal uh, thoughts to, uh, to that, the, the person, the friend who's died. Uh, and therefore, actually, given that the, the press have full access to the Bryce Norton elements of it, um, the, the ramp ceremony in, in Camp Bastion is, is rightly, I think, sure, a well, Let's matter. go back to, to Vaughan's first point about that footage. As the media advisor to ISAF, that you're called and they said, this guy, Vaughan Smith, got this footage. Uh, what, what should we do about it? What's your, what's your advice as a media advisor? Well, uh, you, you raised the point about um, how it was slightly disjointed, that uh, the different reasons they gave you, and the first one was operational security. I, th I think, uh, and I'm not, I, I'm not making excuses for, for whatever experience you had, but I do think that sometimes, and this, this really is the, one of the points that I, I put out more generally earlier on about uh, a, a certain lack of understanding and potentially really the military needs a little bit more training um, in, in, in how the media works and, and how it operates. Uh, one of those things is uh, to, to a tendency or perhaps a, 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 yeah, a tendency to want to try and put everything into operational security where actually editorial decisions are not necessarily operational security, they're editorial decisions. Well, there's, there's clearly no operational security issues there. No, no, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. and, but that, and that is something that... The, the, the army are learning to, to try and explain to the various people who have to watch these and decide whether or not there's operational security. But it is still something that there are mistakes that are still made on it. I would add to it, I was invited to film it by the soldiers anyway. Uh, so, that, um, I, but, that, but that's, that, that's, you know, that's like saying the porter of a, of a hospital has invited you to come into the hospital and film. I mean, the, well, that's an outrageous no, thing to no, say. No, 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 I, I think, absolutely outrageous thing to say. No, I mean, in, in this, this, this is so formalistic. Can you imagine what happened in World War II? I'll tell you what happened in the Falklands. It was the ultimate come-as-you-are party. When we threw 17, we, civilians, the farmers as well, threw 17 bodies into a pit after Goose Green, there was none of this crap. We were allowed to film. We were allowed to recall. 
a padre uh, of, of, of two power read out the names. They were there on the thing. There was, no, there was none of this running around. I'm afraid people get killed in wars, whether the wars are good wars or bad wars, and most of them are bad wars. My now, that's what you will not accept. I no, really think, Lorna, you're arguing for a sanitization. No, not at all. My, my point there was simply that um, you have been invited by the Ministry of Defence on an embed uh, to then say that a soldier in a, in a patrol base allowed you, said you could film is, is possibly not... No, but I think that it, the, the, the direction of travel, as they say, Lorna, from the Falklands to this incident, is that things that were filmed as a matter of course... Yeah. are now being attempted, it appears, it appears, trying to be managed, managed off the screen or off the page by the Ministry of Defence. And Vaughan's accusation is that they are using devices such as the, you know, casualties to achieve that end. Now, put your Sky New Deputy Foreign Editor of Sky News hat on now. Do you not have some sympathy with that? No, no, and that, absolutely. And, and that, that's why I was saying, I think that, that for example, coming up with OPSEC reasons where there is no there, there is no OPSEC reasoning but I do think some of that is slightly a, a misunderstanding of what the media is trying to achieve. It's also a reaction to a number of very negative stories and that have been covered in a fairly disingenuous way. I'm also, the, the, other, the, other, the other big uh, issue is that, that from the casualties issue is that um, there is a tendency and I, I can say this as a Sky person, there is a tendency to go looking for the bombs and bullets every time you go somewhere um, and to completely uh, disregard the, the, what you want know, to call them, the, the success stories. Um, and, but the reconstruction, the, the things that aren't particularly sexy in terms of imagery. Uh, and, and therefore it looks as though there is nothing but war and every person in Afghanistan at every minute of every day is under fire or being blown up, okay. when that is clearly not the case. I think probably, Jonathan, would you want to respond to, to that? Do you agree well, I, with I, that kind I of Well, I sympathise for Lorna, but now I'm out of uniform. I don't have to defend a system that, as I've already said, is increasingly controlling. And, and, and my, I'm afraid my sense is that the cursor is moving. Uh, what she is describing is an atmosphere where, where people are trying to iron out the 10% errors rather than magnify the 90% good stuff. It's, it, it is moving from a command atmosphere to a control atmosphere because I just think we're trying to eradicate the errors rather than look at the, the vast majority of press stories which were positive. And I think as Robert rightly says, the idea that we can control the media message is one that's rapidly becoming out of date because the way that, that communications work now uh, a greater openness is going to just simply overwhelm the control mechanism. And in part, I sense that's one of the, one of the things driving the increasing drive for control is a fear of the spread of information and the speed at which it flows. But I'm afraid I think in time it's going to be a futile attempt and we're going to need to, you know, I think the American attitude is much more robust. Odierno, I remember out in, uh, in Iraq, he used, to, he used to be very robust this as a commander's leader. He used to say, get out there, talk to the media, this is really important. If you make a mistake, doesn't matter, it's tomorrow's cat litter, move on. You know, so the idea that there were so many bad stories, I mean, who cares? Who remembers? It no, just gets wiped out. So I, I just agree think, that all I'm just saying is that I just think that the MOD has, the UK MOD, funnily enough, is moving towards a more controlling line, whereas the American attitude of much more openness and, and people talking all the time and accepting errors is actually more healthy. Robert, do you want to pick up on that particularly? Do you want to make a comparison? Just, just, a, very, as well? just, just a very interesting point because you're talking MBA speak here, you're talking Midwest business school, messaging, controlling, journalists, and I see some very distinguished ones in the audience, it's actually what you're doing there is what the hell's all this about? What's the story? What's the thing that really matters? And when you're being given a message by however intelligent a military officer, do you know what my first instinct is? It's whether I'm talking to a mafia punk in somewhere in Calabria. Is why the hell are you telling me this? Why are you putting it in this way? And what are you not telling me? We'd, we just should not. I mean, messaging seems to me to be completely ludicrous because any journalist worth her or his salt is going to ask why. How, why, what, when? What is really going on here? And is it news? Is it dog bites man? No news. Man bites dog. Whoopee. And it, you know, it, 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 it's news. You, the idea that you can control the information space, I, which you can if I you're delivering somebody... I suggest the that there should ever be an attempt to control the press yeah. or 
that it should, oh, it it's should what, be it's, desirable. Oh, it's where it's got to in Afghanistan right now. But what I would uh, suggest, let's go further, because Vaughan and I both had this, where your conversations have to be recorded by your escort officer when you're going to the canteen. You can't go to the cookhouse where the are coming. Let's let Lorna have a bit of space here. What I would suggest, and at no point have I said, on the contrary, that um, we should try and control yeah, the press or that it, it would be desirable to. What I would say is that if you want to get out and get the story on the ground in Afghanistan, don't embed. So don't how, ask the how, MOD how, to pay for it. How realistic is it to cover you. Afghanistan without being embedded? Pe people do it, and increasingly people are disembedding well, nice. at Sorry. different <laughs> points across the region. Yeah. So, uh, yes, of course, the, 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 the British military has ways of doing things which obviously antagonise journalists and there may be more control than there was before. But there is also the point that when you are invited by the Ministry of Defence on an embed, you are their responsibility, they're paying for you and they're hosting you. So to a degree, you go out there without being embedded in that case. Right. Can, can, can we, I just add I, to your I, American I, experience we, on this? Sure. Very, I, 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 I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah, no, having, you must have the audience. Having said they were distinguished journalists in the audience, we should hear from Please do. I think something said yeah. Jonathan Sorry. Steele I'm, just back from Syria is here. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, do you want to say anything? book out, well, too. <laughs> I just wanted to pick up on the whole Green Book thing, because, I mean, oh. people in this room know about the Green Book, but I think almost nobody outside this room in the general public is aware that there is such a thing as the mm. MOD Green Book, mm. uh, which is prior censorship, that we, you have to sign it in order to get this embed, which gives the MOD the right to read all your copy, look at all your pictures, check all your video before you send it out. I mean, it is extraordinary. And I think journalists, to some extent, have to take the blame for this. We go along with this. Why isn't there a revolt? Why don't we just refuse? I mean, the Americans do not have this system mm. of the Green mm. Book where you sign the right of the MOD or the right of the Pentagon to censor your stuff before it goes out. Why do we go along with it? And why don't journalists who do sign it write in their articles in The Guardian or The Evening Standard or wherever it is on ITN say this report or this article was subject to prior censorship by the MOD, just as we do if we go to... To Iran or one of these countries. And Robert, Robert have, you, have, you ever, have you ever told your listeners or readers that, that uh, you I had have from time to time, but I take Jonathan's point absolutely not enough. And I would say, by contrast, the year before last, the best run I did, and it wasn't an embed, I was escorted, um, driven from A to B. I did a cultural tour of Afghanistan and got real stories with the Americans. I went to Herat, I went to Ghazni, which was not a nice place at that time. I went to Bamyan, and I went to Mais Anak. Who knows about Mais Anak, the biggest copper mine, open cast copper mine outside um, in the, the copper belt in Africa, which is being taken over by the Chinese. The complexity of stories, and the Americans did not stand in my way, civil or military, and I could write what I like. And I, I, I wrote a storm. I, I got about eight articles out of just one half day in a fantastic place, very well prepared. But there was, I looked Charlie Mayo straight in the eye, there was a far more grown-up relationship between us, except it did break down in Herat, is that the Americans went off in the armoured uh, armored convoys and we had to thumb a lift with a taxi. The taxi driver was absolutely splendid. <laughs> I, I think we should just pick up a bit of detail on the, on the Green Book, because you mentioned yeah. Johnson. I mean, it's a long time since I read it, but my memory of it is that it's mostly about operational security. It's about kind of not giving away where you are. It's certainly not about tr uh, not transmitting scenes that might be bad for morale or all that, all that sort of the embarrassment bit. It, but is that what you think it means in, in reality? Well, I, mean, um, I mean, Vaughan has got it there. He can read it out. Okay. I think it's <laughs> paragraph 43. We'll be here it a long says time. That they, they can look at your, uh, your reports yeah. to see if there's anything which could be of benefit to an enemy. Well, that's anything. I mean, it, it's a soldier complaining of the food. Ooh, the it's a photograph on Facebook. You know, this could be a benefit to the enemy. Mm. It's ridiculous. And it also has a sentence, which I think you can read out for us, about taste and presentation. It says, it says, normally there will not be any issues of taste and presentation, but in sudden circumstances we can uh, uh, require you know, this not to be used because of the sensitivities in the air. So it goes beyond... Okay. Anyone, anyone with, shall we say, a military background who... Excellent. Excuse your man. This is, this is Charlie. Would you like to uh, introduce yeah. yourself, Charlie? Charlie, man. Um, 
the yep. vile yep. accusations we've thrown at you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name's Charlie Mayo. I left the army uh, before Christmas, um, and I spent 10 years really working in military communications. I was head of comms in, in Iraq a couple of times, in, in Afghanistan, uh, in the Olympics, and so on. Um, and there's just a couple of points. First one, uh, Lorna mentioned about the military media, the knowledge, the, the understanding. There was a period of time, uh, 2005 through to 2007, where we invited the media to come down and take part in the final military uh, operational training that the units were doing on Salisbury Plain before they deployed uh, out to Iraq or to Afghanistan. And the aim of that was to develop exactly what you're talking about. It was real journalists, not people pretending to be journalists, real cameramen, real producers, spending 24 hours in the field with soldiers reporting on what they were doing and producing a package for, to, to be broadcast within the exercise. And what it did, did was develop that relationship of understanding, of trust. So, of course, when they then went out on operations and met the same people, that relationship had already been established. And that uh, made a big difference in that ability to handle the media in difficult situations. Can I just interrupt you saying, does, is the truth not, though, that by trust, what you really mean is acquiescence when we need it? Is, is it no, not really no, that it, a mo a difficult moments like that, if somebody trusts you, you will be able to persuade them to agree with you? Uh, there's a bit of that, but it's, it's more about understanding. It's more about looking at Lorna as the uh, producer and understanding what it is she actually needs and what the cameraman or the journalist really needs to produce a story and the time it takes uh, for them to get what they need done and for them to understand that actually they can't take all the kit they expect to take and they're going to have to do it at night using a red torch and not normal lights and they're going to have to carry the kit because no one else is going to carry it for them. And it was that sort of stuff which was really important for them to be able to, to do their job. But there are a couple of other points. Um, Vaughan talked about casualties. Um, I've had occasions where journalists, photographers, have taken photographs of soldiers who've been injured, okay, um, and civilians. And those journalists got permission from that soldier or that civilian to use the photograph. If they didn't get permission, they didn't use the photograph. Um, and we've allowed, I allowed photographers into the hospital in Bastion to take detailed, you know, grisly photographs of military doctors, surgeons doing operations on people. And those have been published. But this is an ongoing issue with the Ministry of Defence. It's about families. That's the official look. You know? We don't want to upset the families. But the real issue is it's the ministerial bit. It's about what is this all about? Do we really want to show the British public these sort of pictures? Because that's what it, that's what it boils down to. And finally, uh, Jonathan talked about trust with journalists. Um, we, in the military, we don't have a career stream in communications. So there is no time for a military officer soldier to develop that relationship of trust with any journalist because it's for six months and you see them for a couple of days. And so there is no real trust, unless you're uh, lucky like I've been, to do it for a long period of time where you have developed that relationship of trust because you know if you lie once, you're finished. And that is one of the issues which the military has in developing trust. Okay, thank you very much, Charlie. Can I just invite, before we get the panel to come back, other people who may have been on embeds, either on one side or another, who have experiences they might be useful to share here? Hi, thank you. Uh, Major Phil Whitfield from Defence Media Ops Centre. Um, we're here tonight, and, um, but I, I'd like to, uh, to, to back up what you said earlier on uh, about the, uh, the, the job of the... Um, uh, the, the escorting officers. It's part of our routine role to go to theatre with journalists uh, and uh, assist uh, journalists uh, when they, then they wish to go to, uh, to Afghanistan to report on uh, the conflict there. Um, I think without exception uh, we will bend over backwards where we can to give the journalists what we want. We spend a lot of time and effort before we go out there liaising with that journalist to find out exactly what uh, they wish to, to achieve when they're in theatre. 
Uh, we assist them to, uh, to explain to them what is achievable and what, what plainly isn't. We assist them with, um, with, with general life out there, and like you said, we're on their shoulder, what the gentleman here said, we're on their shoulder um, night and day, providing with a, a, them with advice and protection when they need it. Um, and the Green Book is there um, as, a, as a means for the MOD to check what is, being, uh, what is going out there. Uh, but the sole means for that is to protect the MOD, but more importantly, the, the guys on the ground uh, who are being reported on. Uh, in the vast, vast majority of occurrences uh, when that material is checked, uh, and there is something that is requested, uh, is not broadcast or published, uh, the journalist will, will say without, uh, you know, without hesitation, OK, happy with that, that will not go in. Um, and on occasion where the, uh, the Green Book is, um, is breached, uh, that does cause uh, quite enormous problems, and it does happen uh, from time to time. Well, first of all, thank you very much for speaking. Can I ask you perhaps at least one question, because I'm sure other colleagues will have one. Can you assure us that when you are the escorting officer and you're looking at the material, that you don't have in the back of your mind, I wonder what the minister or the minister's spads back in London will think of me letting this video go out? Is that ever a consideration in your mind? Because I got the impression from Charlie it may have been a consideration. The majority material will be um, OPSEC, is what we call it, the check for operational security by the team in theatre, the, uh, the Afghan Media Ops Centre in theatre. On occasion that is uh, delegated to us, when that does happen, it's entirely for security reasons uh, whether or not that is decided. So are you, are you saying that you or your team have never objected to a piece of video because of the impression it gave about the Army's efficiency or the Army's... If it gives a biased... Impression. Well, I don't think pictures necessarily give bias, do they? If it gives an unfair impression, if it who does judges not the fairness? That, that, that's Us as phrase. the subject matter experts for the military um, effect that we're trying. So to I'm do. not an expert, or Jonathan. We've got nearly a hundred years of journalistic experience between us. If if you see, this is where it goes say, wrong. If what you're yeah. trying to say is a biased, unbalanced opinion, then we would we cannot stop that from going out but we would suggest that a, uh, a more balanced view is taken. Okay. Um, Jonathan, what would be your view of that? Well, I mean, it's all language, isn't it? Um, <laughs> what does bias mean? What does it, you know, and you, the, this, the argument goes on and on, and the question is whether, the question Robert's saying is that what you're implying is, is a form of censorship, and, and uh, you have to say that you can see where he's coming from. So, you know, the argument would go on forever, so it's almost fruitless, but, but the point is that it, it happens, you know, so... Do you want to comment on then, Lorna? Um, yes, a couple of things. Uh, on my three embeds with the British Army, um, I've spoken to my uh, minders, my military minders, and two of them have, have clearly admitted to me that they have been uh, properly briefed to steer my reporting. So I could, I recorded one of these, I could deliver the evidence, I just didn't want to drop anybody in it. But, um, uh, so, uh, you know, I think that deals with it. I think we also need to remember that um, Afghanistan and Iraq, these are expeditionary wars of choice. Um, these aren't wars of national survival, um, and this has got to inform uh, these matters. Um, uh, the other thing, uh, just to address this Green Book, um, one of the problems with the Green Book is uh, the engagement the military have had with some of our journalistic institutions. I can read them out, because it, it reads on the front page, the following media organizations have participated in the development of the MOG Green Book. And this is, I think, problematic. Newspaper Publica Publishers Association, Newspaper Society, NUJ, British Broadcasting Corporation, Independent Television News, it's quite a long list. Um, I think that it's time for us to revisit this. OK, Lorna. Um are your experiences the same yes. as uh, your colleagues? I mean, put your sky hat on for a second again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, there's just one very quick point I would say about the... Charlie was mentioning that there is no career stream for media operations in the British Army. That's a really key point because you, you brought up the, the, the American Army as, uh, Robert, you were talking about it so much better on, on embed with them or they're much more open. Well, I wasn't they're, on a military embed for that one. I've got more information than all the rest of the embeds put together. But, but the US military are... Um, do have a very specific career stream for public affairs. I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that that's a reason why they're any better. I'm just it saying isn't. they are slightly, they do have much more in-depth training. They do a four-year course on it. Anyway, uh, that, that was that point. So it does actually make a difference between the two. Um, without, for, for, for that matter, advocating... It's a legal issue, a cultural either. issue, I think, is more important. Mm. Um, but I think what's key is the issue of trust that's been brought up a few times, is 
that it needs to be a genuine trust and it's an individual trust, not, a, not one that can be applied to everybody in the army or everybody, uh, every journalist. And I think if, if both sides take the time, and both sides are guilty of not taking the time, if both sides take the time to build a relationship and build, and I don't mean so that the journalist gets access, you know, I don't mean a sort of payoff, uh, if both sides take the, the, the time to build that relationship and the background and learn the context that both are sitting in and, and the agendas, for want of a better word, of both sides, then there can be a much more constructive approach to it. But it does apply to both the military and to the journalist, because I, I have seen, I have been the producer to correspondents who have gone out on the ground and have not had the, the requisite, even the minimal background uh, on the story that they're trying to cover, which is a feature of the news the way it is today, but is also something which antagonizing the, antagonizes the subject of their story if they're inaccurate, ill-informed, and clearly haven't done their research. So journalists are guilty of that, and I've seen it happen on the ground as a Sky journalist, and it's been embarrassing. Um, at the same time, the military need to understand where journalists are coming from. As Charlie was saying, um, need to understand that a journalist is not going to be the mouthpiece for the military. They are not going to put out military propaganda. It's going to be the story the way they see it and in a balanced and fair manner, but the way that they see it, what they witness. And therefore, you can't stop them from, you, know, you can't dictate to them how they're going to tell a story or what they should be seeing or what they shouldn't be seeing. Um, there's a, a case, just as a, a, a quick example, there's a case recently, as with my military hat on, um, I took a, a journalist down uh, on a, a battlefield circulation uh, with General Carter uh, down to this journalist particularly wanted to tell the story of how British troops were lifting up uh, their partnering um, operations to the same level as the rest of the NATO contributing countries were. Uh, and he wanted to show this in Helmand. So we took him down to Helmand and, and I said, you know, you can have this, you can, we can do this, we can go to a checkpoint that's been handed over, we can go to a checkpoint that's in the process of being handed over. How would that fit? You can interview General Carter. He said, yep, that's great, that would fit nicely. We went to the checkpoint that had been handed over to the uh, Afghan uniformed police, uh, and a firefight broke out within sight of the checkpoint. Uh, he dashed across with his camera, as you'd expect, started to film it. Somebody else there, uh, working for the Ministry of Defence, got... Uh, uncomfortable about the fact that he was uh, filming a firefight uh, because that might misrepresent what they wanted to put across. Um, I was quite happy, clearly because it's happening, no one's saying that Afghanistan's at peace and clearly it's happening and therefore he should be filming it. Quite rightly though, he also noticed that the British troops sitting uh, in the checkpoint nearby didn't move and left it up, up to the Afghan uniformed police to go out and deal with the problem. Um, and he covered it in a very balanced way and very much what was going on. But I didn't contribute to how, how you know, he should look at it editorially or stop him from doing anything. OK. Let, let's look now at where this might be going. I think we've, we've, we've kind of come where we've come from. It seems to me that there are kind of two models here. There's the, what appears to be the British model, which is there's a green book. We can all trust each other. We can all understand each other and all sort of get along OK. And there's American model where... And I, I just looked this up, this document this afternoon. It's um, Psycho Psychological Operations Media Subcourse P0816 by the Army Institute for Professional Development. And it's just pages and pages of how to manage the media. But at the end of the day, actually, the reporters just go off and do what they want. So the British, you, you see, I'm trying to find a kind of gets back to my old friend GB Limited. There's a kind of GB Limited approach. And then there's what some people would say is a more realistic approach. Is I know you American mi military are trying to manage me, but actually I'm still a free agent at the end of the day. Now, I mean, is that, is that, a, is a, is that a fair characterization, Robert, first, of the two different systems and the alternatives going ahead? Yes, it is, because I must say we talked about Vietnam, but let's talk about the Falklands, Grenada, uh, 1990, 91 in the Gulf, and I think that this is where the Green Book pathology comes from. And it's a terrible mistake. They actually misread the lessons from the Falklands because there's the famous thing that Hugh O'Shaughnessy mentions that when they go into Grenada, that Admiral Metcalf sees the press boats in front of them. They want that he wants to shoot them up in the water. You know, with, okay, you know, be, be, be my guest, which is uh, an old thing from Admiral King, who was commanding uh, Atlantic uh, U.S. naval forces, who said, "Keep the media out, 
tell them who won at the end of the battle if they're lucky, you know, and, and, and there is that kind of attitude. Um, from the Falklands, as I said, it, in practice it was a come-as-you-are party, but what America particularly read from the Falklands, we were all white, not, no, not entirely white, but we were all male, all British citizens, all of a certain age, absolutely no foreign, there wasn't even Commonwealth, European or whatever there. And this is disastrous, this idea that, 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 that they can control things. To answer your question, though, immediately, the Americans do have protocols and practices, and they do, they do talk about the theory of this at, 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 uh, at, at great length. But I do find them in practice much more relaxed in the field, where you have a thing that actually British soldiers, for good or ill, think of the bad days in Belfast in the early 1970s and Derry, that soldiers were allowed to talk for themselves, and very, very good they were at it, because they came across as real human beings. That capacity has been lost, and yet I have found in places like Nawa and Naja and so on that you come across US, particularly US Marine Corps, because it's absolutely in the ethos, and they will talk at you about everything under the sun and tell you really good information. And it's very interesting to see occasionally a British minded press officer trying to stand in the way of that. There's nothing they can do about it. The Americans culturally have a completely different approach. But let's talk about. Um, Scandinavia noir. Isn't it interesting how Afghanistan has come up both in the killing and in Borgen? And look at how the Danes handle media military relations, and they would think that we're wasting time on this discussion is completely nuts. Well, I speak as a man who's watched every episode of Borgen other than the ones about Afghanistan. Afghanistan. So <laughs> yeah, you have to tell me two. afterwards what yeah, I missed. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jonathan, what is the right way ahead? <laughs> <laughs> Blimey. Um, well, I, I, I think, uh, as I said at the start, I think uh, as we're engaged in conflicts, not proper wars of survival, I think that we're talking about battles of perception, battles of influence, um, and you're compete it's a competed narrative. And if you're going to have a competed narrative, you need to be out there competing. So uh, I think that uh, soldiers are very good interlocutors. I'm a great believer in commanding, not controlling. I think that soldiers should be allowed to talk. And I think the Ministry of Defence should be much more robust about taking the 10% hits that it will inevitably take and just yeah. ride over them. That's my view. Go on, and then Lorna, on this, the right way ahead, and then we'll open up to other views. Uh, I, I've been in discussions with the um, uh, military ops in the MOD, and they've been actually, in fairness, very forthright with, with information. And I've learned today that um, there's an all-bat uh, of the media operations, um, and there are uh, under, uh, in, the, in the whole British military, uh, 604 places, not all of them fill, filled, um, for media operations. There are 101 places, not all of them filled, for press officers, like the gentleman behind. Now, I would like to see that cut down a little bit. I mean, uh, we're talking about a battalion of infantry. Um, we're talking about um, you know, uh, this, the cost of all this, of a medium-sized broadcaster, it seems. I just don't think that's what the public need. Um, I don't think it's a good uh, use of our money, our taxpayers' money, and I think that actually the money should be given to the BBC or something. You might like it. Learn something. No, 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 you're very welcome, you're very welcome. So you said you're, so you said you're an MOD press officer? Uh, yeah, I don't work in MOD, me and Bill, and I work in DMOC with uh, most right. of the rest of the guys who are in the operations centre. Okay, um, the, thank you. Of the press officer figure that you've quoted, the thing is that most of those guys, media is like their eighth job. They're at least double or triple hatted. They're you know, adjutants, oh. they're stuff like that. And effectively, if we need to speak to them about a media issue, they are the individual that is nominated to do it. They get for that they get a glorious nine days training, which is part of what we provide, and it is a very very sort of basic course and a very basic thing. So they're not they are not dedicated media operations guys. They are doing many many different jobs, but they're the nominated point of contact. Okay. Do you want to offer a view on the way ahead? Uh, well, I mean, I, Kim, I'm an Kim, get Kim Kim to tell us what the way I mean, yeah. we for the yeah, Kimball, about the years. What I would say is a lot of this comes down to uh, overprotectiveness. Um, you know, that it does come down to trust, it does come down to personalities. Um, we try and we try and allow people to have access. We realise it's a democracy, we realise it has to be transparent. But at the end of the day, certainly in terms of casualties, and I think this is a sensitivity. You know, when people lose someone that is part of their regimental family or is someone that's close to them, 
you know, various people have different reactions, but the, a lot of the reaction tends to be about protectiveness. Sometimes it's about protectiveness. And what, you know, the very familiar sort of description that you provided there about all kinds of excuses why we don't want it to go out, at its, at its heart, there's an element of overprotectiveness. And I think that, you know, people think about families back home, that they worry about, like, you know, people being named on Facebook or being named in the media before, you know, next step can have been informed correctly, all the rest of that sort of stuff. Um, and I think we, we, we live as well in an environment, we work in an environment now where information is very free, it's very fast, um, and that also plays into that protectiveness. Um, anyway, there it is. Uh, way forward, I think we just have to try and you know, work closely and sort of find a sort of common ground. And it will always be a common ground. We will always be opposing uh, opinions, and it's all about how we move forward. Okay. Uh, Kim, uh, from The Independent, is, shouldn't have come I'm in the back now. Uh, sorry, you're evening stand as well now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all in. Yeah, yeah, London TV standard, yeah. coming for sure, guys. Uh, I've, I've you've just arrived, so I'm afraid yeah. I'm in no position to comment on the um, on the debate. But sure. all I would say is I've just come back from a month in Mali, and the amount of uh, or the extent of news management by the French military was quite astonishing, oh. uh, <laughs> and, 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 and very very unlike the way they are with journalists in what have been in Tapiza, for example, in Afghanistan. So, uh, so in, in so what in what sort of way? Can well, I mean, just basically uh, not allowing access to the front line. I think this is, uh, you know, I was there for about five weeks, and I don't think I understood what was going on at all, uh, because, frankly, we were being stopped at every juncture from, uh, from going to where the fighting was taking place, and uh, we'd be allowed in, and that's for everyone, including the French media. After the place had been sanitized, after the dead bodies have been moved away, uh, and we had... Dutrion saying they've killed hundreds of uh, jihadists. Whether that's a good thing or not, I don't know. But anyway, there is no evidence that we can look at to say whether or not um, this actually happened. We don't know how good or bad the fighters, the the uh, insert or slashes were, because um, we frankly didn't see uh, any uh, anything in detail. Uh, to know. I mean, it's obviously the case that when the French pull out they will be back. But this, in my experience, was uh, certainly um, the least, the least well-reported conflict that I've ever come across. Okay, that, well, that's really helpful uh, contrast. But uh, could, you, could you, can I just do one other point? Well, because you probably didn't hear the beginning, but I mean, I think the, the proposition has been certainly from Vaughan that the Ministry of Defense is, is finding reasons why things cannot be shown or reported rather than that can be. Would that, would that be your experience in recent times? I think it's, it's changed um, for the better over the years, um, but not enough, uh, in, in my view. I think there should be um, you know, much more transparency. And, um, and I just caught the tail end of what Robert was saying uh, about letting ordinary soldiers, sailors, marines speak. And, uh, and I think there's a, there's a tremendous uh, amount of overprotectiveness uh, of, the, of the man on, on the front line. And, and the one incident which sums up for me um, that was up in um, Marja in 2004 or five, you know, when the Iranian ship charges uh, started coming in, and they were, uh, I think, they lost three in in one patrol, and there was a young soldier, a ten-year-old, uh, who was describing, you know, very movingly how he saw that the snatch in front of him um, get blown up. And um, his, his fear at what happened and shock in discovering that <coughs> one of the dead guys was his uh, best friend. And then this um, young man was describing this um, very slowly and very movingly. Um, and at this point, uh, one of my colleagues, who shall remain nameless, um, broke in. It's the wrong thing to do, journalistically, anyway, breaking this guy's narrative. And he said, when something like this happens, don't you want you to go out there and crack some heads? This young guy looked up, slightly surprised, and said, "It's not all the simplistic, sir." <laughs> no. So I do think that you know, if you do let soldiers speak, and sometimes they will come out with things which are unpalatable, yeah. which are not on the script. But that doesn't matter. That's how they feel. And I certainly feel, just catching the tail end of what Robert says, that there should be you know, far more freedom for them to speak. Thank you very much. I think there was one other hand at the back. Uh, Thank you. <clears throat> um, Rupert Nickel, uh, I know Robert from the Falklands. You counted them out and counted them all back, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yes, counted them out, counted them back. I know Charlie as well. Uh, the Falklands was now over 30 years ago. 
And at the time, it was just over 30 years to the Second World War. Uh, the army had had the experience of Northern, Northern Ireland. The Americans had had the experience of, um, of Vietnam. And there was a lot of talk about the Israelis doing it best, because the Israelis gave people more pictures. Um, we, in the Navy, knew very little about how to do this, and I had no training at all, but a very strong belief that we should be as helpful as possible and build trust. I believed it was an art. And I've seen it turned over a long period of much more war into something much more like a science, with grids and messages and so on. And yet what I'm hearing from everybody is it's about personal trust. So I'm pleased to hear that, because it's what I believe. On the subject of the French, my, my way forward was that you could write as many memoirs as you liked, as many green books as you liked, but only personal experience could overcome the gap between the military and the media. So I started trying to fire large numbers of student journalists out into big military exercises uh, in Scotland and for NATO. Um, this seemed to be working with the UK forces to some extent, and Charlie certainly helped me on this. We achieved quite a lot, I felt, in terms of giving people um, some kind of indication. When you took them to the French, they regarded it as an exercise in the more people you give them, the more they're trying to stop them. Uh, and that was a, a, it was as though we'd sent them people to practice sitting on them. And that seemed sad. So the message is very different in the different countries. It's very different. It does come down to personalities. Some Italians are wonderful. Some Turks are brilliant. Um, some Danes are very good. Some, I found, didn't really understand journalism at all 10 years ago. But obviously they've learned. What has happened since I was involved is almost continuous warfare on land. Uh, as you say, ch chosen expeditions. We now hear that uh, we want to withdraw from that type of thing. We may move back towards, um, with the big carriers coming and concerns in the, in, in the Indian Ocean and further east, we may come back to something that looks a bit more like the Falklands. Uh, there is no way to disembed a journalist who's in a ship. He cannot go anywhere else. So you've got to learn the lessons um, of trust and cooperation. It amazes me that we now look back on the Falklands, as you say, a come-as-you-are party. Brian Hanrahan used to talk about it in sessions like this as a sort of golden age of freedom compared with what was happening in Iraq and Afghanistan. And yet at the time, we were having exactly this discussion. All the same things about control, about seven layers of censorship, about what should and shouldn't be done. Um, there were lots of complaints. There was a big uh, House of Commons committee on it. So I think the ultimate lesson is there is always going to be tension, as you've said. Uh, there's a necessary tension between government um, and, and media. It's important. The media's role must be seen to be important. Um, and trust is everything. And working together is everything. Learning to understand each other. Uh, getting on and doing it. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed for that. I just want to take this discussion to a slightly different place. We are in the Frontline Club, which in a sense is about independent journalism as much as anything else. And we're coming up to the anniversary of the death of one of my colleagues, Terry Lloyd, who was what we used to call freelance or uh, unattached, in other words, not embedded. And when he died outside Basra, uh, some people thought it signaled the end of kind of independent reporting alongside embeds. He was not embedded. And I kind of wonder where that strand lies now. Um, you said that people kind of can go if they want to go outside the military. Well, actually, I, got, I got the impression, certainly when I was negotiating with the MOD of, a, of the return of Terry's body, for instance, that actually these guys were a pain in the neck to the military. Um, and the sooner everyone was embedded, the better. What do you think, Jonathan? Um, yeah, I think more particularly, uh, was it Farrell or whatever, who caused the death, uh, who got captured and uh, yeah. the guys from units were not allowed to talk about went and rescued them and got killed and, and uh, the New York Times was very generous in sending money back. Um, I mean, there is an aspect to that, obviously. Um, no, I, I, I think it's almost an irrelevant debate because I think what you're going to end up with is, is soldiers being their own, their own journalists. So I just think, I think the way the speed of media is going to go, I think that stories are going to leak out anyway. Um, but if so, you, I mean, but I got, reading some of this PSYOP stuff, as it's known, that the kind of control of the battlefield, there's a, there's a kind of real battlefield, and then there's a kind of, almost a virtual battlefield, a reporting battlefield. 
And this mm. command and control extends across the battlefield in every sense. So anyone who comes into the battlefield, who isn't, if you like, under your umbrella, is a problem. But, the idea, but that's a very old-fashioned idea of a battlefield. Yeah. You know, battlefields don't exist anymore. The oh. battlefield is the street. The battle, there is no such thing as a battlefield. Facebook. That's, you know, and, and, and absolutely. And Facebook, it, Facebook is, 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 is where the, 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 comp the narrative is fought out. So um, it's, there's no such thing as a battlefield. This is, this is old fashioned language, and it's a, it's a sort of top down directive controlling mentality uh, trying to control the uncontrollable. Um, so we need to be slightly more subtle than that, I think, and, and, and arrive, learn to be a player in a more confused and chaotic uh, arena rather than attempting this control, which I think is what you're suggesting. And what's your view on that, Vaughan, as a man who's been embedded and very, mm. very unembedded? Um, I, I have spoken to some media uh, uh, operations people before who rather suggested that being a unilateral was somehow irresponsible. Um, but I think you know unilaterals or freelancers that you know aren't always treated well by the news industry themselves. I mean, uh, and maybe it's all a good thing. But um, I think <coughs> we should remember that you know the sign on the media tent in in Camp Bastion says media operations. It doesn't say media facilitation. Um, and I, I, I think we've all been slightly routed. I think you know they've 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 defeated us. I, I think uh, we've somehow <laughs> failed to kind of um, uh, do it. And, and I wonder how much um, our desire as journalists for access has perhaps numbed us to some of our responsibilities. Um, but no, unilaterals, uh, they're not very popular. Okay. Now, Lorna, you were involved in Libya where Sky had some spectacular unilaterals in the sense of us you know, going in with the, uh, the rebels alongside. So what, what do you story. think the role of, of unilaterals or independents or freelancers is? I think sometimes it's the only way to get the story. And I think with competition such as it is, as it is across uh, journalists and news outlets, it, 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 there is more and more pressure to get that exclusive, to get that story that no one else has got, and therefore more and more pressure to be that journalist who goes where no one else goes. Um, certainly in Afghanistan at the moment, more and more journalists, as areas get uh, less volatile, more and more journalists are starting out on an embed and then disembedding halfway through. And, and the issue for the Ministry of Defence is where does our responsibility start and where does our responsibility end? Which is, is, a, is, a, valid, is a valid point from their point of view if something happens to somebody who was embedded after they've disembedded, if you see what I mean. Um, but I think, I think the pressure is on, uh, especially with everything moving online at a, a rate of knots with Facebook and Twitter, uh, the pressure is on for journalists because they're competing against Joe Blogs yeah. as well, um, to get out and get uh, the, that story that no one else can get, and therefore you push the envelope further and further and further. Right. Um, and one other question on a slightly different theme. What about troops shooting their own video? I mean, that series on BBC Three. Our War. Our War. Mm. I mean, w is that a better way of doing it from, uh, from the military's point of view? We'll film it ourselves and just hand it out to you. The, the only problem, I think, I think there's a slight difference between, for example, Our War the, the our filming and our, ourselves and then handing it out to you idea. Um, our war was, was a combination, a, a, a compilation of different sources of footage. Um, there's a difficulty that we have combat camera teams uh, in the army as well. And uh, they are, they work for the Ministry of Defense. They will not put things out that do not go along the lines of, excuse the expression of military messaging. And therefore, it's obviously going to be all favourable to the military, and it's been filmed by military cameramen. Um, so from that point of view, from a journalist's perspective, it's one, clearly, it's one-sided. And although it's very useful footage to have, we as journalists want to keep our editorial control and want to know where this footage has come from and want to know which bits have been editing out, edited out. Uh, and so it's very useful to have sometimes, but we wouldn't want to use that as the sole source of our work because we want to be able to see it for ourselves. The whole point is we're we want to be able to witness the stories that we're telling as journalists. Um, our war was slightly different in that we were seeing it through the eyes of soldiers, individuals' own experiences, and therefore it was done, uh, it wasn't done seen through the eyes of the Ministry of Defence in that sense, I think. It was some fantastic journalism I thought it was fantastic, in, a, in, yeah. a, in a way that you didn't spot. When you got to the death of the platoon commander, <laughs> sorry, it showed A, the incompetence of the command and control, where was the company commander, and B, there was a radio system and communication system called Bowman, which has never, ever worked as it said on, on the tin and really let them down. And that was a huge scandal in both cases. Very few journalists raised it from that. 
But it wasn't us that got the evidence, to our shame. It was there for everybody to see. OK, we're now coming towards the end. Let's have a round as fast as we can of quick points, and then I'll ask the, the panel to sum up. So quick points, please. civilian casualties, and if you have so, um, what uh, restrictions have you encountered doing so? Okay, can you, can you keep that one figure up, Summer, so we can get as many points as possible? Gentlemen down here, sorry to keep you running around. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, the name's um, Ewan Grant, former UK Customs Officer, who's um, worked strictly on the civilian side, but I was a liaison officer with the um, U4 military mission in Bosnia. Uh, and my question is really based on um, what Lorna Ward said earlier about, um, I think you implied that there was a tendency now, perhaps, for each side, if I can use that term, to go back into what they're familiar with. And I would, uh, I would just say, isn't this becoming an, an even bigger problem for the military in its widest sense, Army, Navy, and Air Force? Because much more of society, journalism, but also society and government, has any real links with the military ethos now. And uh, from what I, because when I was working in Bosnia and later in Ukraine, uh, I really saw a lack of empathy among a lot of my colleagues with the military approach. And okay. that's not a criticism of the military. That's the other okay, Lorna can pick that up later. Um, Um, sorry, my name is Nathan Jones. I'm a student of war studies at King's College. Um, I was just wondering, it seems to me that there's a real fundamental dilemma in the, in the, the, the kind of ministerial angle um, faces here. Because on the one hand, the, um, the military is trying to kind of restrain access to an extent, whether in a direct or an indirect way. But on the other hand, we are fighting these wars of choice that we mentioned before. Um, the objectives of which are more likely to be these kind of abstract concepts such as freedom of speech. And I mean, it seems to me that it's really hard to kind of like marry that because on the one hand, the mission is all about securing freedom of speech for these people. But then how can we, in good kind of conscience, go about doing that when we are limiting kind of media access to journalists on our own side? And I was wondering, perhaps Jonathan might like to talk about that. Okay, thank you. Let's get two more and then throw it to the panel. Gentlemen there in the yellow pullover and then down here. I don't really have sort of questions, just a couple of observations. Sure, so my name's Simon Meyer. I work for the BBC. I used to be in the British Army for a number of years, commanded soldiers in Iraq and various other places, been in Afghanistan. Look, I just want to kind of emphasise what I've heard said, which is about the nature of the conflict. Is it a war of choice? Is it a war of national survival? If it's war of national survival, then I think there's every chance that the Ministry of Defence would be welcoming with open arms its journalists to portray what is going on to galvanise the British public into support, etc., etc. When it's a war of choice, then it is going to be... Um, closely, as closely as possible, uh, controlled, as, as, as General Jonathan has said, from Whitehall. And I don't think we should underestimate the bureaucracy in Whitehall in terms of the kind of machine that is attempting to clarify what are the messages that as a government we want to portray, what is the role of the individual departments within government, what message are they trying to portray. And then when you kind of take that to the next level, the British Army at the same time is trying to work its way through this it's probably engaged in an operation that's not particularly popular with the British public. How is it going to kind of maintain its image and its positive impact and its profile with the British public at the same time that it's being asked to, to uh, take part in this war? So I think this kind of, it's no surprise, frankly, that there is going to be this controlling mechanism because it affects not just the media side of the operation, but it affects other sides of the operation, the way that the operations, are that there's an attempt to kind of control them at arm's length from the UK. This issue of trust, I think, is, is, is interesting. I think there's a very good example of perhaps where that trust broke down in 2010 with Stan McChrystal, who invites the press in, gives them unfettered access, and it leads to the sacking of Commander Issa. So I would have thought that a lot of people are probably a bit nervous about that kind of question. Okay. The other thing, though, that I'm just... Final point. Final point is... I absolutely hear what Lorna says about being balanced, telling the whole story. It's not just about the bombs and the bullets and all the rest of it. So why is it then that twice a year when the Operation Honours and Awards list comes out, is this given to the press in advance? 
Are people made available to talk about their brave acts of gallantry, which have taken place under fire and all the rest of it? So to me, you can't have it both ways. Okay. Gentleman down here been waiting very patiently and then perhaps squeezing one air because there's another former city student there I must bring in. But okay. James Fowle, a one-time warrant officer. Uh, a straightforward question. Uh, looking at the difficult parameters you're working with, who, who do you talk to to get to the truth? Perhaps uh, Robert and then Ron could answer that. Okay. Thank you. I'll try and absorb that. And, uh, thank you. Alistair Bunkle, um, Defence Correspondent, Sky News. And um, Stuart, perhaps this was suggested you should have sent me out on embeds when we were... Yeah. Um, Could, no, couldn't afford Jonathan, insurance. Um, <laughs> something you said was uh, quite poignant to me. I'm now on the outside, I can say what I want. Uh, is it, should it not be recognised that, of course, a lot of the people that are looking over what we write or what we report can be relatively junior? And in like any company, any business, they are very aware of their future career trajectory. So is it any surprise that they are often much more cautious than they should be? Uh, whether we like it or not. And Lorna, I'm very sorry, but um, <laughs> because you have just spent obviously six months in Afghanistan and coming back onto our side now and working with me, how would you therefore, knowing what you know, cover the next 18 months, two years of the Afghan conflict as it draws to a close? British embed, American embed, Danish embed, unilateral, whatever. Okay, that's a good place to start then, Laura, as we sum up. Oh, no pressure. Thanks. Well, spot. In, in, Thanks probably a couple, in probably a couple of minutes now that you're getting back into the Sky News way of business. Instead of all those long reports you wrote for me. So. <laughs> Thanks, Sally. Um, just to respond quickly, first of all, to the, the first point that was made um, about going back uh, into their sides, if you like. I think that was in the, I was saying that was in the context of, of trust and that really, I know we've said it a lot, but coming back to that, it, 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 the only way to stop the military going back into itself and the media being completely separate from it as well is to have that relationship of trust and keep it going. It's going to be more and more of a challenge, I think, as we uh, draw down from Afghanistan and as the military stops being in the limelight, uh, which it's been in now for over a decade. And that's going to be harder and harder, I think, for the military, but something that the military is going to have to work on to keep some kind of connection with the general public and with the media. Uh, to answer Ali's question, clearly I wouldn't want to divulge to the rest of the room what we're going to do at Sky. So, um, no, I think, I think there's, there is a, a, there are a huge number of, of stories, as Robert pointed out earlier, which are, are, are being left uncovered in Afghanistan, whether they're embedded or not embedded or to do with the conflict or to do with the country. Uh, and also more so, and I think this is where uh, the media needs to change, is the media uh, uh, traditionally, historically, although it's, it has changed over the years, has had a defence correspondent. And, th and, and that, uh, the, the brief, has in, uh, historically been quite a narrow one. Uh, and gradually it's got wider and wider because of the nature of the conflict that the defence correspondent or media covers and the nature of conflicts that we have. And that means that defence has to include uh, reference to the economy, to regional security, to politics, to uh, development, uh, and therefore it's a much wider subject than it used to be. And for that reason, I think it's really important if we're going to cover Afghanistan over the next 18 months, is to have it covered, disembedded with the US, with the UK, with, with whichever, whichever forces are doing, but also, more than anything, with the Afghans, looking at where... Afghan Afghanistan's going, regional security is going, what Pakistan's doing with it, what impact is it going to have on the countries around it, what impact is it going to have on its economy when thousands of troop leave, troops leave the country. So much, much broader <coughs> picture, not just the idea that it's some NATO campaign which is moving on to a different NATO campaign. It's a much, much broader issue than that, and I think that's where the coverage needs to go. Thank you very much. Vaughan? Yes, I, I'm trying to deal with a civilian casualty uh, question. Um, I don't think you go on an embed with the, uh, the British military uh, to get civilian casualties or, or the civilian side of the conflict. Um, I, I have seen, you know, I have seen actually somebody, a friend of mine filmed, I can't remember who, exactly who was involved, uh, filmed the Grenadiers in 2007, where you actually see the military mind uh, uh, divert uh, the camera away from some civilian, civilian casualties. So I, I, I think uh, the military don't really have an interest in, in revealing that to journalists. Uh, six quick points. The caution question first. If you live in a control culture, you'll be terrified of making a mistake. If you live in a command culture, you'll know that you can try your best and you'll be forgiven if you make a mistake. 
if you're saying people are cautious, it's because they're living in a control culture. So it's a cultural problem, not, not a, a necessary problem. Um, truth. Define your terms. If only there was such a thing. Point two. Um, if the government has fucked up but won't admit it, where's the truth? Where's the story? It makes liars of us all. Story in tomorrow's Guardian. The Shadow Defence Secretary will admit that the Blair and co. didn't understand what they were doing in Iraq. We all knew that at the time. Could we go on the press and say it? Of course not. How did we respond to the press? Half-truths and makes liars of us all. I mean, there's a problem. It's a real problem. It's why the press, it's why the MOD is now so paranoid about taking to the press, because they realize they don't understand what they're doing. They're fucked up. There's a thing that uh, Professor Hugh Strawn runs at All Souls. It's called the Changing Face of, of uh, the Changing Nature of Warfare Study. It's a series of lectures. Serving officers asked to go there and talk. We went there for many years. Uh, I spoke there twice. Uh, these books were then uh, so interesting they decided to publish them. The MOD banned them from being published. It then decided actually not only are we going to ban them from being published, we're going to stop all serving officers going to All Souls and talking about their experience. We are going to stop the public learning experience about what's going on because we are embarrassed about what people are saying. Come back to the question of what is the truth. Um, so your point about freedom of speech. I think I've answered the question. You know, I mean, it's an abstract game, but actually it's about politics, not about freedom of speech, so let's not get confused. And I suppose my final point is to say uh, that the Rolling Stone was used by the Cheney regime to get rid of uh, Admiral Fallon. Uh, so when Stan McChrystal saw the Rolling Stone in an interview coming, he should have smelt the coffee and run a mile. <laughs> Quite a good article, though. Uh, Robert, final word. Final word, yeah. Um, well, there are others who should have final words more than, more than I. The fact is that my autobiography should be called Making It Up. You make it up as you go along, and you, to answer your question, you make the relationship as you go, and the time, the place, and the lover. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And you look somebody straight in the eye, and if it works, and people will confide things because you want to maintain the trust and will use the story. And they know that you are going to use the story at, uh, at a particular point in time when it when it is suitable, um, that's the way it's, it's going to work. I didn't make my point nearly well enough that, that I made it at the, at the end of my introdu introduction. Things are changing so much, frankly, that the fact that the name of a fatality uh, is put out long before it is announced uh, by the MOD, by her schoolmates at school in Bangor County Down, on Facebook and Twitter, you cannot do anything about that. To try to deal that in the way that we have talked about is like pushing water uphill. But paradoxically, there's another tendency in journalism at the moment. If the, you know, Richard Kapuczynski and Vasily Grossman and their great tradition is not dead, there is the, the person who hangs around and, and exercises strategic patience is getting out wonderful long stories, uh, uh, which reveal what's going on. Some of the books now coming out about Afghanistan are fantastic. And the kind of person that we should celebrate, great colleague of ours, uh, Kate Clark, who was refused uh, to be the embedded correspondent of the BBC. She's freelance in Kabul. She has both languages. She knows what's going on. There is somebody who really just works at the story. Talking of embed in Afghanistan, I've, I have been a weasel about it because I've played Diffid against the MOD and done uh, bits of both. And by the way, Charlie, don't worry, you don't have to close your ears or, or constrict your sphincter <laughs> on this one. Do you know which ministry of Her Majesty's government I have had most difficulty with? It's the FCO. And what was it about? It was about, and it happens, it comes up over and over again, and you know this, sir, it's about drugs. And how we'd been there, and Mr. Blair was going to do all sorts of extraordinary things because bad, uh, bad drugs do things in the hands of bad men on bad streets in bad Britain, and it comes from a bad place, so we were going to do about it. It is one of the most intractable problems, and I have gone into this forensically with colleagues of yours, and who kicks up a fuss and tries to get me kicked off embeds? It's the Foreign Office all the time. I will conclude with one thing, and here is an appeal, and it's a really important point that, um, that, that, that uh, Vaughan raises. One of the most difficult things, and I don't know whether it's cock up or conspiracy, to get at is the bill of seriously wounded and injured. 
physically and mentally from these two long wars to try and compile it from MOD figures, from getting the most serious, going through the charities like combat stress, you name it. They're all very willing, but the way that they can play on the lack of interface between the Civil National Health Service and the military recovery element, I still cannot get at a realistic figure of these injured to whatever degree, because they're going to be with us, they're going to be with my family, they're going to be people we're going to have to think about um, long after I'm dead. And that is one thing where actually we've all fallen down. But the MOD is, in, is included on that. It is, the, Kim will know, it is the most <laughs> difficult thing to put together. Even one year's casualties from Iraq uh, or, or Afghanistan. And that really is a real challenge for real journalism. And yes, you know, it's not the whole truth. It's not a logical, positivist, philosophical question that somebody like Gilbert Ryle might say. It's a truth that we all recognize, and we know it when we see it. And sometimes it can be a very bitter truth, but that's why, that's why we do the job, funny enough, and we don't do it at a minister's behest. Well, thank you very much indeed to our panel. Uh, thank you to Millicent for putting the panel together. Thank you for the comments from the floor, particularly from the Ministry of Defence and from the Ministry of Defence people who came along. Would you like to thank the panel in the usual way? That's great. Thank you.